All right, welcome everybody. Hope you guys are having a good. How you guys having a good summer? Doesn't feel like summer yet, does it? It's like when? When's it gonna quit raining? I mean, I'm not complaining. I'm used to baking hot, boiling when you get out of your house kind of summers, right? So I better be quiet. We may get some of that. So I don't mind the. I like the rain except when I don't have electricity. So other than that, it's great. We're on this series. This is our fourth week. We call this "You God in Love," and we've been learning about the difference, one of the things we've been learning is the difference between what the world defines as love and what God says love is. And that'd be a great, you know, discussion question in your small group, really. What do you think the difference is? Or how have you progressed in your own spiritual journey between what you thought love was and now what you understand love to be? <clears throat> it's, we talked about this. Love, you, this is something you got to figure out. Because love has the greatest potential to bless you and the greatest potential to hurt you. And, and so we got to figure this out. You can't ignore it. It's a, it's a subject that's central to the human experience. So the world, one of the things, well, the ways I would say this is that the world's definition, you can see this in movies and, and, and songs. It's like it's about how you make me feel. Their definition of love is how you make me feel. God's definition is how are you doing? How are you doing? And how can I help you? And how can I help your experience? And how can I help your life get better and you know, your life become uh, more blessed, really. What, would, what kind of world would we live in if the majority of people were oriented in that kind of love? It'd like be heaven on earth, wouldn't it? And that's why he told us to do what we're doing. He commanded us to love people the way uh, he loved us and the way we'd like to be loved. So that's the journey we've been on. And today I want to talk about this thing called covenant love. It's one of our core values. And when you start talking about covenant love, you start thinking about all the different relationships that we have on earth. And of course, the highest earthly relationship is marriage. It's not, in my opinion, it's not the only example of covenant love. But I want to start with looking at that as an illustration of what covenant is supposed to look like. Because of what the world has defined as marriage, we need some training on this. Amen? I know I needed some training on it uh, growing up with a different definition, a different understanding of love. So marriage is, there's a lot in the Bible about marriage. There's a lot in the, in the Old and New Testament. It's not silent. And there's a lot of instructions about our duties and our callings and what it's supposed to be about. Uh, one of the longest sections, if you're not familiar with this, is in Ephesians 5. If you want to grow in your marriage, read Ephesians 5. And take it literally. I mean, really take it to heart. You, you're you're going to find it's going to rub up against some things probably if you didn't grow up as a Christian. And at the, toward the end, though, Paul makes an amazing statement. Paul wrote, God used Paul to write Ephesians 5. I want you to notice what he's really getting at here. And this is why we're not just talking about marriage. We're using it to illustrate other things. But he said in Ephesians 5.32, he said, This mystery called marriage <laughs> is profound. How many of you have been married over five years? Okay, put your hand down. How many of you would raise your hand and go, this is a mystery? <laughs> you just thought you had it figured out, right? It's a lifelong journey. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers really to Christ and the church. That's a profound statement. What he's saying is this whole thing called marriage is a, is a you know, lifelong or however long you're married journey. That is really an illustration of the real marriage, which is Jesus and the church. And, and the Bible says we're the bride of Christ. And, and if you read the book of Revelation, which describes our ending, our beginning of eternity, we're, and I know some people have a hard time figuring this out, and I have a hard time figuring it out. Actually, is physically, marriage is for earth with a, with a husband and wife, and that ends in heaven. Did you know that? And we talk about that. Like People always get uncomfortable. No, man, it's not true. It is true. It's what Jesus said. And Diane and I talk about it. It's like this is our 38th year, I think, of marriage. It's like, what's that going to be like? <laughs> you know, are we going to live near each other? <laughs> hey, sister. I mean, I don't know. It sounds weird. It just feels weird <laughs> being real here, you know. But, but I, it, it must be, it must be that what God has in mind is... It eclipses this, and this was a springboard to that, because I can't imagine we'd be all sad about that, you know? You're looking at me weird. I understand. You have to process this just like we did. 
But marriage is an illustration. That's why we're going to use it not just to talk about it, but to illustrate other relationships. Now, if marriage is the highest example of an earthly human covenant, which I believe it is, it's not the only one, but it's the highest one, then divorce would be the highest example of its breakdown, of its failure. Now, the church does not talk about this like it should. It's like an epidemic that nobody wants to talk about. And, and that's terrible that we don't talk about it. And the reason we don't talk about it is because it's painful. But it's not going to get less painful until we talk about it. And God has some, a lot to say about divorce, too. You know, it's very clear. Not a lot, but what he says is very clear. It's not ambiguous, okay? It's not like who can know these things, okay? There's a couple of things in the New Testament that Jesus was very clear about in divorce. I want to look at them. Matthew 5, 31, 32. Furthermore, it has been said, this is Jesus talking now, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Watch this. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality or what we call adultery, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So what is Jesus saying here? A couple of things. And one of the things he says very clearly here is that the biblical grounds for divorce are more narrow than the world's uh, grounds. What the world says is not what believers are to commit to. Com believers are called to a higher standard. There is a biblical ground for divorce. It is, it is unfaithfulness. It, is, it doesn't mean you have to. But it is biblical grounds because what has happened is someone has not just shown weakness in the marriage. They have left someone for someone else. Okay? They have walked away from that covenant. Whether they meant to say that and that's what they were saying by their actions. And there has been a, a, a breaking of that union. Now, we've seen God heal that. And, and there's many great success stories in our church we know about. It's exciting. So we're not saying it has to happen. He's just saying that's the ground. And then, and what the world says is you're, you're called to a higher standard. Christians are called to a higher standard on a lot of levels. And this whole area called love, we're called to a higher standard. Not just marriage, but love in general. For instance, if you start looking at all the commandments on love, you start running into things that are very challenging. Like turn the other cheek or go the second mile or forgive. Forgive lots. And at first, it looks like God has called us to a position of, of vulnerability and weakness and being used. But actually, here's what God's saying. By telling us to live at a different standard, you know what he's actually saying? You're different people. You're a different person. Do you know a Christian is a different person? Now, we like to get up and shout about that. We're different. We're new creations in Christ. But that means you live at a higher standard. It's not, God doesn't give us those scriptures just to make us feel good about ourselves. He gives us those truths, those realities, so we can live different lives. We are called to love better than the world loves. That's why we have to. We are commanded to love, and we are commanded to get this right. If you don't get anything right, get this right. If you get this right, you'll get everything else right. That's what we've been saying during this whole series. And it's not easy. It's challenging. But it's worth doing. Now, Paul, the apostle, adds to what Jesus said. Here's one more thing. And just so you know, 1 Corinthians 7, 15, he says this about divorce. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. In other words, you can't stop him. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. So here's the thing. There's two biblical grounds for divorce, adultery and abandonment. And, and he said, it's not what the world says. The world says incompatibility. Or you don't meet my needs anymore. Or you don't make me feel like you used to make me feel. Or I don't feel you love me like I love you. Or just all kinds of things that are just possible, endless possibilities. He says, I'm calling you to live at a different standard. Now, I personally think, and there are some, a number of Bible teachers that teach this, that physical abuse qualifies in, as abandonment because you're, you're literally forcing someone to be removed from your presence for their own physical safety. So I put physical abuse in the abandonment, what the Bible teaches as abandonment, you know. I don't put a mental or emotional abuse because Lord God knows where we'd stop with that. You know, if you really love me, you wouldn't cook my eggs that way anymore. And I mean, you know, we just, we just have the capacity to go crazy on that one. So it's really clear what the Bible says. Now, since believers are called, we're, why are we called to a higher standard? Because we're different people. We're born again. We do not have the old sinful nature. We are born. We, if you're not born again, can I just say this doesn't apply to you? 
You, your biggest thing, obviously, get, get, get your marriage healthy, but get with Jesus. In fact, I, I think it's, almost, it's very hard to get your marriage healthy if you don't get right with God. Because of the corruption in human nature. Because of our inability to love the way God says to love. That's what we've been studying this whole series about. Now, because God calls you to live differently after you're saved than before, then having been through a divorce does not necessarily, in our opinion, in my opinion, disqualify someone for leadership in the body of Christ. We have a number of staff people, pastoral staff, who've been through divorces. But, but those were... Before they met Jesus, before they were, when they were living by the world's standards instead of God's standards. Once you become a Christian, what you're saying is, God, I'm going to live by your standards, not just the world's standards. Can anybody say amen on that one? So, um, God speaks of the dynamics of divorce and why he hates it. Now, notice, I want you to read in Malachi 2.16. I want you to notice this. There's a whole passage here, but we're only, gonna, we only have time for one verse. Look at verse 16 of Malachi 2. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. I want to teach you the dynamics of why relationships break down. If we can figure out why the marriage relationship breaks down, I believe we can take that downstream and figure out why the other relationships break down too. I'm going to show you different relationships this morning. He hates divorce, not divorce people, but divorce, the act of divorce. Why? For it covers one's garment with violence. What in the world is he talking about here? Did you know that was in the Bible? This to me is one of those fascinating scriptures on the dynamics of divorce. It explains what happens to us in the process and why God is against it. Therefore, notice this. This is very interesting. It says the Lord of therefore take heed to your spirit. That you do not deal treacherously. My wife and I, Diana, she, we've covered this scripture in our entire marriage and our entire ministry life. There's a scripture in, in Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. The, the Hebrew kind of has like put a garrison around your heart. Not to keep it from getting hurt, but just don't let it stay unhealthy. Guard your spirit. Take heed to your spirit. For out of it comes the issues of life. That's what Proverbs 4.23 says. So... Before we do something outwardly, we've done it inwardly. And, he, and so he says, here's how you fix this prop, the relationship problem. Start taking heed to your spirit. But what does he mean when he says it covers one's garment with violence? I believe garment speaks of covering. The security of a relationship that God has called us to enjoy. And, and when that is broken, that is ripped, if you will, uh, the covering is gone. So when a divorce happens, the covering, especially for the wife or the children... Because back in the Old Testament, when this was written, the men, unfortunately, were the only ones that could like really initiate divorce. And women were very difficult for them to make it financially. And so the, they were the, really more of the victims. I think it's kind of equal today, personally. But, but back then, there was an uncovering and a vulnerability that would crash in on people who no longer had that. And this is why he hates it. Because so, it leaves us vulnerable to some things. We're going to look at that covenant issue here. There's a, we got to understand what God has in mind for relationships, okay? And again, we're, we're talking about marriage. We're talking about every relationship. Let's just look at the dynamics here. And I'm a real, if I could, I'd do a whiteboard. This is the next best thing. I've got a little visual here I want to show you. We commit to a relationship. Why? Because we want companionship, all right? So we commit, whether it's marriage or, you know, there's other relationships like friendship, uh, partnership, uh, mentoring, uh, empowerment. There's other relationships. If you could throw that up on the screen. There you go. Thank you. Partnership, friendship, empowerment. So it's not just marriage. It's empower- What's an empowering relationship? Parenting is an empowering relationship. Coaching is an empowering relationship. Church is meant to be an empowering relationship. Uh, spiritual leaders, uh, you know, uh, older Christians mentoring younger Christians, couples mentoring younger couples, uh, par- you know, there's all kinds, uh, really, uh, and, and there's limits to this, but almost there's some work environments that, that the best work environments are empowering. There are boundaries to that. Uh, you know, you, you can only empower, if you're an employer, you can only empower, empower your employees to a certain level. You know, we've, we've had to coach some employers who were godly employers, and they try to make it like a family, and a lot of times employees haven't signed up for that level of empowerment, so, you know, like, they, get, they resent that, <laughs> you know, they, I, I don't know how to tell you this, they're just here for a paycheck, you know, so, so, but there are all kinds of relationships that, to work, require um, 
closeness and mutual commitment. Here's the problem. We sign up for companionship, but, but the, and, and so we start out feeling close, but distance can happen. There can be a stretching of that. We can feel separation kick in, and we go, what is going on? And I don't think we can fix this personally until we understand what God's after in the relationship. Now, I want you to think about every potential healthy, life-giving relationship you have. Start with marriage and work downward. In every life-giving relationship, what is God after? Here's what we said. Remember, the world's definition is how do you help me? How do you make me feel? God's definition is how can I really help you? How can I really improve the quality of your life? That's the goal. That's the orientation. So what God is after in relationship, the only way I see to reduce this separation is to understand that, that God's purpose is character development. Companionship or closeness is the reward. Character development is the means. So if we embrace the process of character development, we get closer. If we don't embrace the process, we get farther apart. So it's humility versus pride. Selfishness versus serving. Faith Versus fear. Whatever the issue is that God is trying to develop in our life, if we, we got to understand, we can get all worked up. This is not working. I don't feel like there's love here. I don't feel like there's commitment here. But the issue is, what does God want to develop in me in this process? Now, sometimes that means long suffering, sometimes that means hard conversations. There's all kinds of things that God will coach you out of and develop into you if you will embrace the process of relationship. And I don't believe we personally grow very uh, hardly at all without relationships. Even, our, even being a Christian is a relationship with God. And if you're going to continue in this covenant relationship with God, in your covenant relationship with Him, you got to grow. Amen? There's times when there's character issues right in front and center. So I've done lots of weddings. I've never signed up. I've never led a couple in the vows that go, well, I just, I just commit. I just want to develop character. No, they, they want companionship. And God, it's so cool what God does. He, he tricks us. We didn't know we were signing up for that. And so, and so, and here's, here's, how, here's how I know, let's just take marriage from it. Here's how I know he tricks us. This is so funny. Because I hear this couple, I go, we are so much alike. I said, that's funny. <laughs> they actually think that. We like everything. We like everything. He lets you see enough that you're alike to go, yeah, sign up for this. <laughs> Six months later, check up. Man, we're so different. We're so different. And then what can happen is you can resent the differences. You can embrace the difference. Sometimes the differences are cool. They're awesome. You celebrate them. You embrace them. Sometimes they're challenges because they're growth curves. They're strongholds in a, in a person's personality. And those, and those strongholds don't come out. They just, they just aren't there. Until you try to walk in some sort of covenant relationship. So character development is the, is the means to the end that we want. Companionship, closeness, partnership, friendship, empowerment is the reward of embracing the character development. Now, where does covenant come in? I love this. Covenant is the overarching covering. It sounds a lot like the word covering. Covenant, to some people, sounds like control. But the real... It's not control, it's covering. Remember the garment? Covenant says, hey, I'm here. You're not getting rid of me. Now, you can walk away from this covenant relationship. I believe you can walk away from your covenant relationship with God. I don't believe he walks away from us. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Doesn't mean you can't walk away from me. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. We saw the kid, the father, the prodigal son walked away. He got beat up by life, right? He was in pigsty. So you can walk away from God, but God is a covenant God and teaches us to be covenant people. And if we can become covenant people, we provide the covering to endure the challenges of character development so we can enjoy, everybody say enjoy, 
looking at me strange right now. There is an enjoyment waiting. There is a blessing waiting. It is called companionship, closeness, partnership. Oh, my God, how many times are we, we missing the power of partnership? Because we won't embrace the process of character development. It's, it's so rampant. So when you see a culture, America is one of the world's leaders in divorce right now. It means we won't embrace the process. You know, well, we're just not compatible. You think a hundred years ago we were any more compatible? You ever thought about that? We just understood things differently. We were close into our Christian values. We understood the process of covenant. We, we went through the challenges of growth. And even if we didn't grow, we didn't leave. We stayed. And by staying, we grew. We grew. You're just going to grow automatically in some ways. So cover, covenant, where does covenant fit in? Covenant is the covering that says, I'm here. I'm with you. Now, here's a final statement I'm making, and then we're going we're gonna to pray. Um, most, see if you agree with this statement. Most of the pain in life comes on the other side of a broken covenant. How many of you agree with that statement? Think about it for a minute. Most of the pain in life, like a soldier's in battle. I've never been in battle, never been in the military. I almost went in high school, Vietnam, tail end of Vietnam, because I wanted to go. I thought I was going to get drafted. And so I've heard that guys in battle, they start, start out fighting for their country, and they end up fighting for each other in the thick of battle. That's what covenant people do. They're like, I'm not leaving my post, no matter how scary it is, no matter how dangerous it feels, no matter how much... Risk, I mean, I've, I've got this side. I've got my part here. And, and if they leave their post, people get hurt. If we leave that relationship God's called us to, somebody's going to get hurt. Now, I think that's why pain comes. Because somebody, the Bible talks about human nature, our sinful nature, and the corruption that's in human nature. And one of the things in Romans 1, if you look at the list of frailties and, and, and sins in humanity, covenant, being covenant breakers is in that list. So, and, and you may have been on the recipient of someone who left their posts, who bailed, you know, but you know the pain. Here's the good news, okay? I like to end on the good news. And here's the good news. Jesus is the difference maker. Now, where does he fit in on this? Lots of ways. He teaches us how to be covenant people. But first, he's got to heal us from broken covenants. All right. Before he can teach you to be a covenant-keeping person, he's got to heal you from broken covenants. Can I just say he does that? The messianic passage where he stands up and quotes Isaiah 61, which all Orthodox Jews of the day knew referred to the Messiah. This is a messianic passage where Jesus stood up and he said this about himself in Luke 4.18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to do some things. And here's the things. Preach the gospel or the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And he goes on to describe some other things. But I want to focus on healing the brokenhearted. Now let me just say, healing the brokenhearted is a literal, supernatural healing. It's not, you know, we kind of read that, yeah, he's going to help me cope with my pain. No, that's not a healing. Let me give an example. I'm going to use Pastor Mike Park. You may have noticed Pastor Mark is a little different than he's been lately. He's got a, a sling. This is not just a prop. It's a real sling. And the only way, the way you would know this, this is real and not a prop. If I went, hey, Brad, what's happening? Yeah, everybody, just somebody hurt right then. So he had uh, shoulder surgery, right? Dude had his bicep was separated. I played golf with him the week before. How do you play golf with a bicep separated? No comment. All right, so... Somebody, somebody, did you say not very well? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so right now, this is painful, right? Yes. And here's the thing. You can look at him and know that if you touch him, he's going to hurt. But that's the problem with the broken heart. Because you can look at somebody and you don't know by looking. Now, when, after this sling gets off, right now we know not to touch Mike, Pastor Mike. But probably when the sling comes off, it's still going to hurt, right? Yes. But here's what's not God's will. It's not God's will 
that the rest of his life, that's why he went through the pain of getting healed, getting surgery, because the rest of life, it's not God's will that Mike, no one can touch him here. And here's how you know you've been healed of a broken heart. Somebody can touch you there and it doesn't hurt. You don't have to, you don't, you know, you're not supposed to go through life like this. Always guarding your bad shoulder. Never talking about that issue. Always kind of backing off and tightening up and getting your heart starts racing when that issue comes up. You know, that, that broken parental relationship, that failed marriage, that broken partnership, that bad church experience. Where you kind of like just, you're smiling, but you, you're backing out too. You know, because we've all done it. When, you know, we've had, you've had some people come up, in, you know, inadvertently. I don't know how they missed it, but just went, hey, what's up? And that's how, see, when you're not healed, that's what happens when somebody touches that issue. And when you're healed, it doesn't happen. So healing is a healing. That's the part I'm trying to explain to you. When you're really healed, it doesn't hurt to touch it anymore. You can talk about it. I've had people talk to me about the most horrific situations. Child abuse. You know, abandonment. Uh, uh, unfaithfulness. They were a part of that unfaithfulness. And yet, they can sit there and I, I look at them and, and God's using them to heal other marriages. And the glory of God is on their face. Guys, that's a healing. Listen, we've all had, we've all, because covenants are, broken covenants are rampant, broken hearts are rampant. We've all had them. I've had them. And I, I can tell you that God can heal it. And he can heal it miraculously in a moment. And that's what I believe we're supposed to see happen here today. And, you know, I, I want us to talk so much more about this. We've got one more session to talk about it. next. Maybe next week we'll get into more of it. But I, I really believe today we were supposed to take a minute and just pray. And I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. And we're just going to pray. And I'm going to ask Pastor Mike to stay up here. He's such a, a man of faith. And so... I'm going to just ask you to let God speak to you and help you. And you may not need healing, but the chances are strong that there's a number of people here that God wants to heal. Amen? And, uh, and, and the healed can become the healer. So if you've been healed, pray for them. And let God use you when you leave today to help connect people to the God who heals the broken heart. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you love us for who we are, just as we are. And I pray, Lord, I pray against the spirit of fear right now that would keep people from just coming before you. They don't have to talk to any human being right now. But just to come before you and say, Lord, I'm willing to let you heal, really heal me where it doesn't hurt anymore. And I don't want, I don't want this to define me anymore. I don't want to carry this. I don't, I don't want my arm in the sling to be who I am. I don't want my limp to define me. That's not my identity. I don't want that anymore. How many of you want to walk whole before the Lord? Let me see your hand. Just, I don't want to be unhealthy. I don't want to put up with it. Just, just that's it. That's our statement. So I'm going to ask you this. If you're here today and say, Pastor, I believe I'm one of those people. I need Jesus to heal a broken heart. Lift your hand for a minute and just hold it up because you're going to ask Jesus right now. Maybe you helped. Maybe a covenant was, was broken with you. Maybe you were part of the breaking of the covenant. And you're, that doesn't mean you still don't need to be healed, even if maybe you were more of the perpetrator. But if you need God and you want Jesus to heal you of a broken heart, I can remember sitting in that chair over there, and, and I said, Lord, I need you to heal me of a broken heart. You know what? He did it, and he did it in a moment. And he can do it in a moment. Hold your hand up to the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to heal my heart. Just tell him right now. Just, just, it's so good when you just own it. It's so good when you just come straight out and bring it to Jesus, the, the healer, the great, magnificent healer, the great physician. Lord, I am asking you right now to heal my broken heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Heal it. And, and as you, just say those words to him. And as you said those words, if there's somebody you need to forgive, then that's the next thing you need to pray. And I for, just name a person you need to forgive. If God brought you to somebody, Brought somebody to your mind. Just, just, just say it to, just bring them to the Lord. Lord, I, and I forgive this person. It doesn't validate what they did. Quite the opposite. It releases them from what they did. Because you want God to heal you. And maybe you were part of making the pain happen. And you need to say, God, I ask you to forgive me. Just, just let's complete the process here. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. For transgressing, for stepping away from 
calling and the relationships that you called me to. Friendship, marriage, parenting, childhood. Holy Spirit, I thank you for doing the miracle that's needed right now. Lord, I release every person from the pain of that broken covenant. I release them now in the mighty name of Jesus. I release them in the name of the Holy Spirit's coming in right now. He's healing you. Just like a physical miracle. He's healing this. He's healing the broken heart. This is greater than a physical miracle. Because it's almost a worse pain. Let the, Holy, let the Holy Spirit work right now. He's doing it. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus. Now I want you to say, I receive it, Lord. I receive it. And give Him praise for it. Come on, receive it. Just receive it and praise Him for it. If you receive it, praise Him for it. Thank you for it. We praise you, God. It's a miracle. Just receive the work of the Holy Spirit. Our prayer team is coming. We believe in prayer. We believe in miracles. We believe God heals the sick. We believe God heals the brokenhearted. We believe God gives guidance to critical moments. Whatever you need. If you don't know if your relationship with God is what it should be, join those who come and let us pray with you. We'd love to do that. God be with you. Go in peace. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. God bless you.